I wanted to do one more example with forms. And I wanted to look at styling forms with uh, React components. And I also wanted to talk about using um, validation libraries and sort of the workflow in the browser and on the server side of validating and uh, working with that data. So <clears throat> I have an example here and it's gonna use a bunch of different components. So I'm gonna continue on using the um, React Bootstrap components and they have really interesting ways of working with forms. So I'll just show you some examples of that. And I'm also gonna show you a couple of libraries. I'm gonna to talk to you about Formic. So Formic is mentioned at the bottom of the notes this week. There's a paragraph in the documentation about working with Formic and I thought I would do an example that just shows you how to use it. And it's a very cool library for working with forms. And along the way, um, show you how to use a bunch of validation libraries. So I've had quite a few conversations with people in the last number of weeks about validating data. They were working on assignments or working on different projects and they needed to figure out how to, how to validate data that came from, uh, came over an API call or a form in a browser. So I'm going to show you how to work with things like uh, Joy, and there's some uh, there's a package called Celebrate that lets you work with uh, similar things inside of um, Express middleware. How to use I'll use this um, package called Yup. So anyway, I'll take you through all of this and show you how some of these things work. So let's dive into the code, and I'll um, show you what I want to build. So I've got a I've got a project here with two sections. I've got a client and an API. And so I'm gonna do this distributed architecture where I want you to keep thinking about the back end being different than the front end in the sense that instead of building like an express server and everything's all inside this one server and you're serving the front end and the back end all from the same thing, I'm gonna separate them out. So my back end is going to be a really simple express app and <clears throat> I have a very basic version of it here. So this server, essentially it's express and I'm using the body parser so that I can parse JSON out of the uh, requests. And I have one single route, I have a sign up route. So let's imagine that we're creating a, um, we're creating a route that would allow us to sign up a user. So you're gonna register a user in the database. And so essentially you're asking for a number of pieces of data. You want, the, you want the user to pass in a name, an email address, a GitHub username, and a blog URL. So you have these pieces of data. We're gonna pull this off the body and then I'm not gonna do it in this, in this example, but we could stick that into a database. Maybe it's gonna go into Mongo or you know, you're gonna do something with it. You're gonna register it at another service. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna say, okay, this, this data uh, has come in and uh, we're gonna work with it that way. In the front end, what I'm gonna do is I have a, an app and I'm just gonna build a form and I might just run this form so you can see what it looks like. So the form is going to use the React Bootstrap components for building a form. And the way that this thing works is you use the form component and then you can do things like you can group items together like labels and controls. Whoops, it's just switching back. Uh, so here it's finished compiling and here's the, here's the form running. So I have like a label for the name, a label for email. And in each one of these, I have a, uh, a place to enter in the information and I have a submit button. So I'm building this using the bootstrap components. It's basically like what you're seeing here, just a very basic uh, form. I'm also gonna play around with this small bit of text underneath. And you can see that the way that the text is done here, they have this form text and they use a class name of text muted. So it's, it's sort of like smaller, good information for showing error messages or hints to the user about what they're supposed to do. So if you take a look at this form that I have, here it is running live and here it is in the app. I have a form, I have a group for each one of this, like the name group. So these two controls correspond to what's here. So I have a label and I have a form control. 
So what I need to do is I need to hook all of this up and use um, state data the way that we've been uh, the way we've been working all along. But I want to do this in a slightly different way. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to work on the API side. So I've been saying to people, you need to do proper validation in your projects. And what does that mean? So in the case of a name, an email address, a GitHub username, and a blog URL, when this data comes in from the form, I need to make sure that the data is in the right format. So if you can imagine, like what I'm going to do here is I'm going to um, you know, insert data into the database. So at the point where I insert it into the database, I have to trust this data. The data has to be in the right format. The data can't be missing any required fields. I don't want to have corrupt data in my database. So this is my last chance, like right here. I need to validate the data. And if the data is wrong, I need to return a 400. And if it's correct, then I need to return a 201 and say, like, I've updated this data. I've created this record. So obviously, we could write lots of code on our own. So for example, I could do things like, like, let's say name is required. So I could say, if um, not name, then that's a problem. Um, or um, if name dot length is not um, not greater not not greater than uh, greater than equal to one or like we could start writing all of this or we could do it with regular expressions so we could say a name has to be a to z capital A to capital Z maybe a space maybe a dash and we can have many of those and we could write a regular expression that says, okay, a name has to look like this. And then we could test the name. And if the name, you know, if this returns false, then, you know, we could say res.status 400 uh, name invalid, something like that, right? And return. So I could write all of this kind of code manually, but it's really laborious to write this sort of code. So there's lots of libraries out there that let you do this. And one of them that a lot of people really like is this library called Joy, J-O-I. And the idea is that you can write code that looks like this right here. So you can say, all right, um, username has to be a string. It has to be alphanumeric. It has to be a minimum of three and a maximum of 30, and it's required. So what Joy gives you is it gives you a whole bunch of things for saying like it has to be an email address or it has to be a number and it has to be a string, an integer and it has to be between these two, et cetera, et cetera. Like, so it gives you all sorts of really fancy ways to validate numbers, dates, uh, anything, anything that's coming in um, as valid as parameters to um, the code that you're writing in your um, express route. And there's middleware for Express. I'm gonna use this one called Celebrate. And what it does, I'll show you an example. It basically lets you stick a function in front of your route code. So if your route code is here, it lets you put a function in front of it where you can define um, the validation steps that need to take place. And if it's not valid, then it's going to uh, return it back again. So like if I was going to write this with middleware, let me just show you what I would do. So I could say um, function request response next like this. And in here, um, So here's an example of what I'm talking about. So this uh, function validate. So I've introduced my own middleware. So this is, this is this middleware function right here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, whenever something comes into the signup route, whenever data gets posted, I'm gonna get the data from the body and I'm gonna do a whole bunch of checks. And if any of it is incorrect, I'm gonna return a 400 back to the client. 
Otherwise, I'm going to let this go to the next chain in the middleware, which is gonna be this function right here. And that's where it would actually insert it into the database. So that means that this function here knows that the data is clean or validated. It's already been validated by something earlier on in the chain. Okay, but instead of writing this myself, I'm not actually gonna write this middleware myself. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull in pieces of celebrate. So I have celebrate, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna call the celebrate function here instead of doing what I was doing right there, okay? So that's step one. I'm gonna tell celebrate that I want it to uh, validate the, a post. Now I have to tell it which part of the data to validate. So I have to tell it which segment I want to validate. And there's a bunch of different segments. Like you could say, if you look at the API, uh, where's all the segments? Segments can be, yeah, here we go. You could validate the cookies, the headers, the query parameters, whatever, the body. I wanna do the body. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to write code that looks like this. I'm gonna to say to celebrate, I want to work with segments.body, capital body like that. So segments is something I have to pull in from the library, like so. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say that the body needs to match a, an object that looks like the following. So this is where I'm pulling in joy and joy is exposed as part of celebrate. So basically what celebrate does is it, it gives me access to joy in the context of an express route. So I'm getting to write middleware for this and I'm gonna say, okay, it needs to match this. Uh, it needs to match, let me go back up here like so, yeah. Okay, so let's write it the way they're writing it. They're saying, joy.object and, uh, sorry, joy.object.keys. So now you define what the shape of the object needs to be. So if you think about what our form is, our form has a name, an email address, and GitHub username, etc. So let's just do that here. So I'm gonna say name, I'll come back and fix this in a second, email address, uh, GitHub, username and blog URL, like that. Okay, so let's define what each one of these things needs to be. So let's say with a name, I'm gonna say that this has to be a string and that the string is required and that's it. So as long as you give me a string, I'm gonna take that to be the name. So I could do fancy things here, like check on, um, you know, that the name matches some complex regular expression. But honestly, people's names are so complicated. People have lots of different things in their name and you don't want to, you don't want to restrict your, your database so that it can't handle whatever is in their name. So you gotta be careful that you don't assume too much. But I am going to say that the name has to exist. If you don't give me a name, then it's a problem. Okay, let's think about the email. So I'm gonna say joy.string, and then I'm gonna say that string has to be an email, and that email is required, like that. GitHub username, what have I done wrong here? Colon. GitHub username. So let's say that a GitHub username has to be between five and 15 characters long, and it has to be just alphanumeric, like letters and numbers. So it's very specific. So I'm gonna say this has to be a string. Uh, this has to be an alphanumeric string. This has to be a string that's alphanumeric and is a minimum of five and a maximum of 15 characters, and it is required. And finally, the blog URL has to be a string and it has to be a URI. So it has to be like, we're expecting to get a URL. So that is enough right there to do what I wanna do. So I would encourage you to take a look at Joy and it, you can, 
you can go through, there's just tons of things. Like if you say, okay, I'm working with strings, you open up the strings and you can see all of the things that I'm using in, in here for the strings. You can say that, you know, for example, whoops, I'm inside the wrong thing, not object, inside string here. So alphanumeric, or it has to be a credit card. Like this is an interesting one. You know, if you were expecting someone to pass you a credit card, then this is gonna check to see if it's a valid credit card. Um, or what else is in here? Um, you wanna get an IP address, you know? So it's gonna do, it's gonna validate an IP address for you. Oh, there's just all kinds of things. Or you might say it has to be uppercase. So make sure that the string that I get is uppercase. Really, really powerful library for being able to specify all this. So essentially what we're doing here is we have a number of parts. We have, this is the, the endpoint or the name of our route. This is validation middleware. So if we don't pass this validation, we're not gonna get any further. And this is our, our routes, um, actual code. So this is what, you know, the route code that's going to happen after validation passes like that. Okay. So that's good. So we've got our API set up. It's going to, it's set to run on port 8,000. So what I'll do is I will run that on port 8000. So I'll just npm start and my server is running. Whoops, I have a, I need to pull in errors. Oh, there's one more thing I didn't do. Down here, I'm gonna tell, tell Express to uh, send back errors from the validation middleware. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull in the errors function from up here as well. So what I want you to notice about this is that there's very little code. I didn't have to add much code. I basically just wrote this little section here where I describe in code what the data that I'm hoping to get, what it looks like. So you're, de you're defining the schema of the data and then you're, you're saying, if there's a problem, send back an error to the user like that. Okay, let's try this, I'll rerun this, and that's fine, that's good. Okay, so let's switch over to working on the form and do the other part of this. Now one trick, when you're working with a backend and a front end, and they're running from two different servers, like this server is running on port 8000 and my React app is running on port 3000. So you have to be careful because um, in, in the current setup, what I want to do is I'd like to proxy the back end through the front end web server. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, in other words, I want to be able to say slash sign up and press enter and it should work. It should go to my other server on port 8000 and submit it. So it, it kind of makes it look like it's all running on one server. So if I was going to deploy my code in production this way, where I was gonna run everything off of this one port, but in development, I have it split apart between the two. This is how you do it. So when you're building it with create react app, if you go into your package.json, what you can do in the package.json is you can add a proxy section. So if you say proxy and then you give it the address of another web server, it will proxy that web server traffic through your localhost 3000. And so the two of them will sort of get merged together in one and you'll be able to run both of them at the same time. So that's what's happening over here, okay? All right, so let's go back and let's work on our form a little bit more. So what I wanna do is I wanna show you a slightly different way to write this form using Formic. And just to give you some experience of doing it in slightly different ways. And if you look at the docs for Formic, you know, like let's face it, forms are really verbose in React. Forms are verbose in everything. Like when you're writing forms, it's it's just a lot. Um, and it says to make matters worse, most form helpers do way too much magic. And you'll find this when you're working with libraries that do forms, they sort of hide a lot of the details and you just have to memorize a bunch of syntax and so on. But the 
this library you can see here, it came from the fact that this they were building a large internal administrative dashboard and they had around 30 unique forms. And basically they had tons and tons and tons of the same code repeated over and over and over again. So what they did is they stripped that down and made a library that does a lot of it for you. So let me just show you what Formic code looks like so you get a sense of what's going on. Here's a really basic idea. So essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a hook called use Formic. So if you think about what we would normally do, if we were gonna have data, we would have something like set, uh, sorry, const form data, set form data equals use state, you know, and we have the initial state of our data like this, right? So we're doing something similar here, but instead of using use state, we're using this new hook called use formic. And it's an, basically it defines a whole bunch of details about this data. So the first thing it defines is the initial values for all of the pieces of data that you have. And it also gives you a chance to write a bunch of functions. So like when the form gets submitted, this is what I want to do, something like this. So now down here, you can see that what's happening is for the value of an input control, we're using formic.values.email. So essentially this formic object that's being returned, it exposes all of the data, all the state. So basically we're taking the form data and we're putting it into state, just like we did in the previous examples, but now we're wrapping up some more magic around it and we're doing some things to do validation. That's really where I'm heading here is being able to do validation. So let's just start out here and let, let's see what we can do. So I'm gonna pull in Formic. Use Formic from Formic, uh, like that. And instead of doing this, I'm going to say const formic is equal to use formic Okay, so the first thing I want to do is define the initial state of my form. Initial values. So the initial values, I'm going to have one key for each one of these things. So let's think about this. I have a name, an email, a GitHub username, and a blog URL. So let's do that here. So I'm going to say name initially is the empty string. Email initially is the empty string. Um, GitHub username is the empty string and blog URL is the empty string. So those are all my initial values that I have. And let's just do the same thing that they're doing right here. Let's start off by saying when we submit, so I'm going to give a function, I'm going to say on submit is a function which takes a set of values and what it does with those values is to let's just console.log values so you can see what what's in there okay okay so now we can modify our form a little bit so the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to get rid of the post and the action here i'm going to get rid of those and i'm going to say on submit is equal to formic dot handle submit. So the on submit function that I'm doing right here is going to be available to me right here when I'm you know going to submit this right here. Okay, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to add the. I have to turn this input control, I have to make it a controlled component in React. So that means I need to set its value and I also need to set a change handler. So normally we had to write our own change handler and we had to manage the state. But what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say the value is equal to formic.values.name and the on change is equal to formic.handle change, like that. Okay, so this has, Formic has written a, a handle change for me by automatically, which will take care of updating the values inside of the form. So because it's such a common thing that you have to do all the time, there's lots of these libraries that come up which solve a bunch of the problems for you. Okay, so let's do the same thing for the others. So that means that down here, I'm gonna need to do like essentially the same thing for every one of these components. 
but I'm gonna have to change the name. So this will be email down here. My GitHub username will be GitHub username. And finally, the blog URL. And I'll save that and we should be able to play with this now. Let's see if it works. So I'm gonna refresh this. I'm gonna put in a bunch of uh, data. Dave, uh, a at b.com, GitHub username A, B, C, D, E, and blog URL is http blog.com. And I'm gonna click submit. So you can see that what's happened here is that I have got all the data as an object. So it has returned this data to me right here inside of the submit on submit. So this is where I can send to my backend API. Okay, so that's something that that's something that we need to do. So actually, we could try that right now if you want to see how this works. Let's try pushing this data to our backend API. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, I'll leave the console login for now and let's just add a little more a little more data. So I'm gonna do a fetch and I'm gonna to fetch to the sign up route. Now this is gonna to go to localhost 3000 slash sign up and it's being proxied over to my server on localhost 8000 sign up. So that's how come I don't have the rest of the information in here. And I'm doing this in development because when I go to production, I'm gonna serve it all from the same, it's gonna look like it's all coming from the same server. So I'm gonna have um, a setup in production that's more complex where all of the back end and the front end all look like they come out of the same thing. Like if you go to amazon.com, you're not talking to one server running on one app. It's distributed across a whole bunch of different servers and so on. And it all looks like it's one thing, but it's not. Okay, so let's do a fetch. Now, because I'm doing a, uh, a post, I have to modify the way that my fetch works. So I'm gonna say number one, that the method is post. Number two, I'm gonna say that I am going to send uh, a content type which is equal to application slash JSON. So I'm gonna send JSON information to the server and I'm gonna send it as a post and I have to specify, okay, where is this data? Well, the data is here. The body of the post is going to be the JSON stringified values. So I'm gonna pass in the values. So the values are passed to me as an object. That's what you're seeing right here. I'm going to stringify it, put it on the body, send it as a post over to the server like so. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna write a little bit of code to uh, see what comes back. So we're gonna say then we get back a response. So what I wanna do is I wanna check the response. So I wanna see what came back because if you look at how this API server works, API server is here. So when we post this data to the server, we expect to get back a 201. So if we get back a status code of 201, it means that it worked. So that means in our app, we should write some code that says, if the response status is equal to 201, that means everything is good. And I actually have a little bit of state here. It says completed is equal to false. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, set completed is equal to true. And if completed is equal to true, then I'm gonna render success. So we'll know, okay, this data was, was put up there and it was saved correctly and you're now registered. In reality, we could do something much more complex. We could render more parts of the app, but we're just gonna keep it simple for now. So what if we don't get back res.status, then you know what happened? So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna throw an error. And I'm gonna say uh, form not valid. So where am I throwing that error to? Well, I'm gonna throw it to my catch. So when we catch, what we're gonna do is we're going to, um, let's console.log um, error submitting form, and I'll print the error. 
And I'm also going to set the error into my state right here. I have an error state. So I'm going to say set error, error, like that. Now down here, we could render something different when the error happens, or we could change the way that the form looks on the screen, or we could put in an error message. Actually, why don't I do something uh, like this? So I'm going to say, if error is true, then I'm going to render um, h1 error. Otherwise, I'll just render nothing like that so that we have at least some way to display something to the user to say, okay, something went wrong. And that should be enough for us to get started. Okay, so let's try this out. So I'm gonna submit my data. Let me clear this and I'll submit and I get an error. So I want you to notice what happened. So it says, I got a 400 response back from the server. And we can actually go and look at this 400 response. The 400 response is right here. And it's it gives me a bunch of information. So it says status code 400, bad request. And then it says, if we dig down into this, it says um, the GitHub username must be at least five characters long. Must be at least five characters long. So this is in the message. So in the um, inside the message, it goes validation. Yeah, GitHub username must be at least five characters long. Okay, so let's see if we can fix that. So what if I said A B C D E F G and I click submit? Let me clear the console. Submit success. So that time it worked because the data had been validated inside the browser as well as on the server. If I, if I try and submit right now, I get an error because it says this, you know, this, this data is no good. So one of the things I would like to do is I am currently validating the data on the server. So I'm doing this right here. What I'd like to do is I'd like to do something very similar on the front end. So on the front end, I would like to essentially be able to validate my data over here. So I'm just going to paste that code so we can kind of remember what we did. And you might say, why would I validate the data on the client side and the server side? Like, why don't I just validate it once? Well, the point is, I would love to give interactive error messages here inside of my form as the user is doing what they're doing. and update them and say, well, what you've done here isn't going to work because of this or because of that before they send the data. So I'd like to know that the data is valid in the form, send it to the server. The server does a double check and says, okay, do, do I accept this data? It checks it again. And if it works, it passes. So your data is going to go through two layers of validation in the front end and in the back end. And we can actually use very similar, um, a very similar way to do this. So let me show you, if we go and look at Formic, Here's how you do validation. So validation, uh, they use, I wanna show it to you. Yeah, I wanna show you doing it with Yup. Okay, so they use a library called Yup. And I have Yup right here. Yup is a JavaScript schema builder for parsing, uh, for, for doing validation basically. Yup's API is heavily inspired by Joy. So what we're doing here is, but this is designed to be used for client-side validation. While Joy is designed for doing server-side validation, Yup is a more lightweight version of it. And you can see what Yup looks like. So instead of saying Joy dot whatever, I say Yup dot string dot required, Yup dot number dot required, etc. So we can do something very similar over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull in everything from, yup, uh, like so. And I'm gonna start adding in my validation scheme. So I'm gonna say my validation schema is equal to this. It's, it's gonna look like this object 
In order to be valid, it has to look like the following. Okay, so step one, you have to have a name. The name has to be, so take a look at what we had above. Name has to be a string and it's required. I'm gonna do the same thing basically. I'm gonna say it has to be a string and it is required. Now for each one of these, you can put in a message. So the message is what would be displayed if there was an error message. So I could say name is required, like that. Email, yup dot uh, string dot email, and I'll say um, invalid email address. So this is the error message if it goes wrong. And then I'm also going to say this is required. Email is required. What's next? GitHub username. GitHub username is going to be yup dot string dot minimum of five. And here's the message if it's wrong. So must be at least five characters dot max 15 must be at most 15 characters and it's required. And what else do we have? The blog URL. So we'll say blog URL. Yup. Uh, sorry, not yup. Yup isn't a function. Yup is an object. Yup dot, um, what is it, string, and it needs to be a URL, and I'll say must be a valid URL. However, it's not required, so I'm not gonna put required on there. So you can leave it out if you want to. So what I've done is I have bundled up a whole bunch of form-related stuff into one, basically into one thing, into one object. So I have the state, here's the initial values, and then each of these values is going to get maintained by Formic. I have a validation schema that says, this is what the data has to look like in order to be valid. I have an on submit handler, which sends the data to the server and figures out what to do if there's any errors, okay? So all of that is happening with this Formic object. Now I can go a little bit further and I can do some nice error messages. So let's let's just take a look at this. So you see here how it says email address and then it says enter your email address and then there's a place to put a little bit of text below that. So here you can see that you do that with form text. So form text and then whatever you wanna show. So I'd like to use that in our code. So I'm gonna do that down here underneath um, the form control, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say form dot text class name is equal to text muted. And then I'm going to say formic dot errors dot name. So if there are any errors for the name, it's going to, it's going to print them, put them here. So Refresh this, has it built? Yes, it's built. So I go off here, if I hit submit, I get this error popping up, name is required, okay? Name is required. If I put a name in, it disappears. If I get rid of this name, it says name is required. So that's kind of cool. So let's do the same thing for all of the, this would be, email let's do the same thing down here for the github username whoops i'm in the wrong spot github username and finally for the blog URL.
Okay, so this is pretty good, but you can see that we have a problem. The problem is that right away I'm getting error messages on fields that I haven't used. And I also, let me see if we can, um, see how another problem I don't like, see how it says GitHub username is a required field? That That's just the default because I didn't put a message here. So let's put a message in here. Uh, GitHub username is required like that. So we get a, a, a user-friendly name. Like nobody cares about, um, refresh this, submit there. Nobody cares about um, the internal variable name that you used. So this is what's kind of nice here is that I can, I can put my error messages all in here and I can just say, this is what the data needs to look like has to be a string, has to be between five and 15 characters, and it has to, it's required. So here, it automatically does this for me. Now check this out. If I say A, it changes the error message. Must be at least five characters, B, C, D, E, F. But if I keep going, must be at most 15 characters. So that's also very cool. If I start erasing, the error message goes away. So the error message is only gonna display it if it's needed like that. But do you notice how all of these fields are getting the error messages automatically, even though I haven't done anything there yet? Okay, so the reason that's happening is because I'm not checking to see if the user has actually touched that field yet. Like if you haven't been in there and entered anything, it's not really your fault that it's not correct yet. It's just that it's missing that data. So Formic gives you another thing you can do. So you can decide optionally whether to render this or not. So I'm going to wrap this right here. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, um, if formic.touched.name and formic.errors.name, then I want to render this. So if the user has touched it, in other words, they've put some text in there, and if it's got errors, then display it. Otherwise, display nothing. So if I refresh the app, I don't have an error message until I actually go in here and, and put something in here. So we can do the same, let me do the same basic structure for all of them. So this would be email, email, and if I don't do that, then I would do null. like so, and here I would do the same thing. I would say, um, I'm just gonna copy the whole thing, it'll be faster. So this would be um, GitHub username GitHub username and the same one down here. Only it'll be blog URL, blog URL and blog URL. Okay, so now I go in and I say Dave and I put in something that's not an email address. So I say foo, GitHub username, humpd, blog URL, and I say um, http slash slash blog.com. So you can see I've got a couple of errors here. So I'm gonna hit submit. And it says, please include an at sign in the email address. You're missing your email address, at email.com. And let's try submitting it again. And it says, no, please enter a URL. You can see that I don't have a proper URL here because I'm missing the colon. And what if I, let's just reduce this down. If I submit this now, you see how it won't let me submit the form and it pops up and it says it must be at least five characters. So then I'm gonna say P H 
D, and then I'll submit it. Now over here, when I submit it, you should see a success come into the server. The server should, should say it worked. So it says, you see that I got back a success, and down here you can say that it added, you know, this user was added. Here's the data that was added. So my validation has passed on both fronts. It's passed on the client side and it's passed on the server side because of using these libraries to do validation. But Formic is kind of neat and it's similar to things that you're going to see when we get into working with Angular where there's parts built in, like some of this common stuff, like working with forms, validating data, and so on, all of it can be streamlined by using these special functions or objects and so on. What's interesting about the way React does it is React doesn't force you to do it a particular way. So if you don't want to use something like Formic, you don't have to. You can build your forms by hand doing all of the stuff that we've seen this week like this. Like you can just do, you know, the regular form and manage your state on your own. But if you're willing to use some of the tools that they have, they have really just nice features for handling a lot of the complexities when you are uh, working on those forms. So I wanted to show you that and I wanted to show you how to work with things like Joy and Yup and how to integrate this stuff into Express with Celebrate, I'll give you some examples of working with all of that so that you can do it in your own projects.